Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Larry Lederman. I am the coordinator of CG's Global Policy Forum here in Ottawa. First, I would like to recognize the presence of members of the Diplomatic Corps. Uh, first, the High Commissioner of Barbados, Her Excellency Yvonne Wax, the Ambassador of Algeria, His Excellency Hossein Megar, the Ambassador of Portugal, His Excellency Jose Moreira de Cunha, uh, and uh, Senior Representative of Haiti in Beijing, formerly the head of the Haitian Embassy here, uh, Natalie Gieselmenos, who's visiting from Beijing. And I'd also like to welcome members of the um, embassies of uh, Sri Lanka, Slovak Republic, Romania. Um, and I'm also pleased to welcome uh, some former Canadian ambassadors who are with us. Uh, first, the uh, former ambassador to China, Howard Ballock, who's visiting in Ottawa. We're lucky to have him here this evening. Uh, former Canadian Ambassador to Russia and Ukraine, Chris Westall. Former Canadian Ambassador to the OAS in Chile, Paul Durand. Uh, former Canadian Ambassador to Kazakhstan and all those Central Asian countries, I'm always reminded, uh, Margaret Skok. Uh, former Canadian Ambassador to Switzerland, John Noble. A former um, Canadian Consul General, if he's here, John Higginbotham and Craig McDonald, our former Ambassador to Finland. I'm also pleased to welcome members of the Senate. We have two senators here this evening, the Parliament of Canada, the Canadian government, including Global Affairs, Bank of Canada, and National Defense. Also faculty and students of the University of Ottawa and Carleton University and members of the Ottawa business community. It's now my pleasure to ask CG's Director of Glo Global Economy, Domenico Lombardi, to introduce our distinguished speaker, Domenico. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce um, uh, Nick Lardy, the Anthony Solomon Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, Nick uh, is uh, one of the world's most recognized experts on China. And I also wish to acknowledge that uh, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, the think tank uh, Nick is affiliated to, is a very close partner of ours at CG, and we are delighted to cooperate and to work with them. And I think Nick's presence today in Ottawa uh, further attests uh, to that. So Nick uh, is going to elaborate on uh, a topic that is pretty uh, timely, uh, China's transition to a new model of economic growth. And when we talk about China's, uh, the Chinese economy more in general, I think, I think three things come come to mind, at least to me. So the first is a transition from um, an investment-based economy to a more consumption-driven economy. And then there is a transition from an investment-driven economy to, um, uh, to a manufacturing-based economy to a more service-oriented economy. And of course, the relationship between these two uh, types of transition. And then we have an international dimension of this transition. Uh, so as, of course, China transitions uh, towards a more service-based economy, uh, we see that, uh, for instance, in Asia, in a, in a number of neighboring economies in Asia, uh, we, we have seen uh, uh, drops in uh, export flows to China. It's true that uh, world export flows, world trade flows are slowing down, but nonetheless, the uh, export drop that we are observing in some of the neighboring economies to China are particularly uh, relevant. And then the third item is um, uh, the international role of China and uh, how this uh, uh, transition sort of interacts with uh, this uh, international role. Of course, this is particularly relevant this year. China chairs the G20. And therefore, uh, you know, the, uh, I the question is to what extent uh, the uh, transition that China is experiencing, and therefore the emphasis on new economic policies, uh, may affect some of the G20 conversation also happening at the same time. Uh, clearly, these are broader issues. Uh, Nick is only going to have uh, about 30 minutes to uh, elaborate. Uh, I know he's uh, going to focus on a number of those issues, not all. Um, but uh, uh, so the plan, uh, the plan for today, Nick, is that uh, you will, uh, after you speak for about 30, 35 minutes, 
We're gonna have a Q&A for about 15 minutes, and then we wrap up at about 6.30, and then we're gonna have a reception as uh, usual at this uh, event series. So without uh, any further ado, uh, Nick, the floor to you. And thank, thanks again for being in Ottawa with us today. Um, thank you very much, Domenico, and I'm delighted to be here. I think China is a, always an interesting topic, but maybe it's a little bit hotter than usual these days. Certainly when you read uh, the press and the financial press in particular, you get a range of views expressed. There are the super bears who think that China's growth has already slowed down to 2 or 3 percent, and then you get others that uh, are more accepting of some of the official data that suggests the economy is still growing at a fairly robust pace. So what I want to do is take you through the uh, transition uh, that is underway, has gotten underway very slowly, this transition uh, towards more consumption, more services, uh, less investment, <clears throat> and less uh, industrial output, with an important dimension of this also being uh, different interactions uh, with the global economy. I'm going to try to leave uh, plenty of time for questions. Uh, if you have a burning question along the way, I don't mind being uh, <coughs> taking them as we go along if, if, uh, if you'd like to do that. There is a handout, you know, economics is the dismal uh, science, and I am going to refer to some of these diagrams, but they're very simple. I don't usually have more than two variables on a, on a slide, so I'm not, uh, there are not a lot of moving parts to this, and it's pretty uh, straightforward. But I'm going to... Um, well, we know there's been a, a significant slowdown in the Chinese economy. The days of the double-digit growth are, are behind us, and the first slide uh, really points that out. We've been slowing down uh, in terms of aggregate output since, uh, since 2007. There was a little pickup in 2009, and then a continuous uh, slowdown uh, uh, from 2010 onward. My view is that a very large portion of this slowdown is related to an adjustment in the property sector. Uh, China, much, many years ago, began investing very, very heavily in property. It became the big driver of economic growth, and it absorbed huge amounts of building materials, steel and cement uh, and so forth, uh, and this is what drove the industrial sector. And as a result of this process, China had a bigger industrial sector as a share of total output than any other economy in the world. It was up around 40 or even more than 40, uh, 40 percent. Um, but the growth of property has slowed down. Uh, it was growing at well over 30 percent in 2010, and it has stepped down, slowed down uh, gradually until it hit 1% last year. The property investment, which is a combination of investment in housing and office buildings and commercial space, only grew 1% last year. You can see that in the second diagram, which I think is on page uh, three, from the 2010 peak, this big uh, slowdown. In turn, that has driven down the growth of may, many, many major industrial products, such as steel, cement, and coal, uh, at the peak, the uh, property sector was absorbed. Remember, China produces over half of global steel, and about a quarter of that steel was going into property. When you think of property in China, it's not like North America, where you think of two-by-fours. They don't have any wood. They use uh, cement and steel for virtually everything. And uh, so there's a huge amount of steel going into property, not just high-rise buildings, but even medium-rise buildings. So as the property demand slowed down, the demand for steel slowed down. And then you can see in the next diagram, industrial growth slowed down. It was growing at 16 percent back in 2010. By the closing quarter of last year, the growth was under 6 percent, about 5.9 percent. So that has brought uh, GDP growth down. Now, industrial growth gets an enormous amount of attention. And one of the reasons is the Chinese publish high-frequency data. We get monthly data on industrial value added, as it's referred to, plus a whole range of physical output data for a fairly broad range of products. The service sector, on the other hand, lurks there in the background. You don't read very much about it, in part because the data on the service sector only come out quarterly. They're not very disaggregated, and you don't get a lot of, uh, of the output data, the real output data that goes along with it. Uh, 
But if you look on, on the sixth slide, you will see that the service sector didn't slow down so much. It started around 10% at the beginning of this period that we're looking at. And uh, last year, it slowed down to about 8.3%. And as a result, you can see that at least for the last three or four years, the service sector has been growing more rapidly than the industrial sector. So this is part of the transition uh, that you heard about at the beginning, this transition to a more service-dominated uh, economy. And I guess the next diagram that actually shows that the service sector is now a little bit more than half of GDP. If you look closely at that diagram, in the first decade of this century, service sector output did not expand as a share of GDP. It was almost flat. And since around 2010, it has picked up. Its growth is much more rapid relative to GDP, so its share of total output is going up. But I should quickly add, it's still relatively low for an economy at China's level of economic development. Based on comparative analysis with other economies, we would expect in a more normal circumstance that services might be 55, maybe even 60 percent of GDP. We don't expect them to be as high as the U.S. or Canada, where we have much higher income levels, but China's below where you'd expect it to be based on its per capita income. So my view is this transition to more services is still in a fairly early stage, but it is underway. Um, the next slide just shows us what's happening to private consumption expenditures, and again, you can see a fairly substantial change. In the first decade of the 2000s, when we had the investment-led growth and a lot of exports, uh, the service sector wasn't doing very well, and private consumption as a share of GDP was going down year after year after year. So something around 47, 48 percent at the beginning of the decade, down to a low of about 34 percent in uh, 2009 or, t or 10. Since that time, it has begun to go up again. It hasn't gone up very much, but compared to the trajectory that it had been on, it is quite a bit higher. So we are getting more, not only more service sector growth, but we're getting more private consumption expenditure. And as I'm going to argue, uh, I think that this is, uh, these, these two developments are obviously closely interrelated, as Dominica said at, at the outset. One of the good things about this is that the job creation from the development of the service sector is much uh, stronger than the job creation associated with the development of the manufacturing sector. And as you can see on, this, on the ninth slide, if you add 1 percent of GDP in the service sector, you create about a million new jobs in China. If you, if you do it in the industrial sector, you only create about half a million new jobs. So the good news is that even though the economy, and this is in the next slide, even though the economy has slowed down quite a bit, that's the red line. You can see it's slowing down since 2007 or since 2010. But the creation of new jobs has held up reasonably well. Growth has come down about 40 percent, you know, from roughly 10 point something to 6 point something. But the pace of job creation has only weakened about 20 percent. So job creation is holding up better than you would expect given the size of the slowdown in the headline uh, growth number. And that simply reflects uh, what I've already mentioned, and that is that the service sector is much more, uh, much more labor intensive than the industrial sector. Now the next slide is going to take me a little bit longer to get through, but I just wanted to give you these five bullet points to argue these are the things that are driving the transformation. I've just gone through the transformation very quickly. I haven't said a great deal about what, what the cause is, and what I want to do now is take you through some of the underlying economics. What's leading to more consumption? What's leading uh, to more services? And the first factor that I want to mention is the demographics. Last year was the first year, we know China's aging, last year was the first year in which the working age population actually declined in absolute numbers. Now why does this matter? It matters primarily because it means it is likely that wage growth will actually certainly stay strong as it has been and actually might accelerate. This is an economy where the wages have been going up uh, by roughly 10 percent per year in real terms for more than a decade. So the wage share of GDP, the wage share of GDP as opposed to the property income share of GDP, the wage share is going up. 
And given the demographic developments, I think that that is likely to continue. It is more or less baked in because, uh, because of the uh, age structure of the population and how it's changing. The second factor that's a driver is this, this idea that goes back, uh, I think, to the 19th century. Uh, the Engel, Mr. Engel, had this idea that the share of expenditures that people devote to certain categories varies systematically as their incomes goes up. And one of the most obvious ones is that the share of income that people spend on food goes down. Uh, you know, at roughly, if your income's, uh, the most recent study I've seen, if your income's $2,000 a year, you spend about 50 to 60 percent of your income on food. If it's $200,000 a year, you spend about 2% of your income on food. So what do you spend more on as you get uh, richer and richer? Uh, well, it, it, to a considerable extent, it goes, to, it goes to services. People spend more on education. They want better health care. They want to start to travel. Uh, tourism picks up quite a bit. Uh, things like entertainment. Um, you can see in China, the, the numbers for entertainment are extraordinary. In, 2013, movie ticket sales measured by, you know, renminbi went up 30 percent. 2014, they went up 40 percent. 2015, they went up 50 percent. This is why this guy that owns Wang, uh, Wang Da, this famous Chinese company, bought out AMC, uh, the big uh, U.S. Uh, movie chain, uh, a few years ago, and he's got another big transaction uh, in the works. So people are spending a lot more on uh, entertainment, whether it's movies or sporting events or uh, cultural events of one thing uh, or another. Now that, again, drives the demand for services. So services demand is going up because people's incomes are going up, so they're going to consume more, and a larger share of what they're consuming is going to be in the service sector, demand for services rather than goods. The third thing that I highlight here is that China has been remarkably successful, I would judge, in building out the social safety net. Um, not too many years ago, most of the population had no health insurance, no pensions, and very little to fall back on except their immediate family members uh, to support them in old age or to take care of them if they uh, had to get, go into the hospital for whatever reason. So here's an economy today with a per capita income, depending on how you measure it and so forth, it's really only about $7,000. 95% of the population has some form of health insurance. Now it doesn't, it's not gold plated, it doesn't cover going to the doctor for your annual checkup, but if you go into the hospital and have some significant uh, medical issue that's costly, you will be reimbursed for a very substantial portion of the cost. Maybe not 100%, but it might be 70, 60, 80%, depending on where you live. And similarly, more and more people have some access to pensions. And I believe that this is a very important uh, factor that has tended to bring down the savings rate. China has had, in the household sector, one of the highest saving rates of any economy ever on record in any time in recorded history. It peaked out in 2010 at 40 percent. Can you imagine people are saving 40 percent of their after-tax income? Remember in the U.S. during the financial crisis there were a few quarters where the savings rate went negative and then got up to one or two percent. I think now it's up to around five percent, maybe six percent. But that's kind of typical for, for very high income countries. You'd have a savings rate in the, something in the mid single digits. Maybe Canada does better, I don't know. But 40% is off the scale. It has begun to come down. Uh, it's now down to the high 30s, something around 30s. Since, since 2010, it's been coming down gradually. And this reinforces the tendency for more consumption. In other words, more consumption is a function basically of two things, higher incomes and lower savings and China has both. Incomes are going up because of rising wages and the savings rate is uh, coming down. So that's another factor that uh, underlies the transition to uh, a more service uh, driven economy, more consumption driven economy. Another factor, and this gets into the exchange rate, which I know can quickly be quite boring, but um, in the first decade of this century, China had an undervalued exchange rate. They, remember, they got an undervalued exchange rate because the central bank was in there buying up foreign exchange. I always kind of try to reverse that, and I think it's better to think of it as they're selling domestic currency. They're buying foreign currency. Uh, 
And by selling all this domestic currency into the market, they drive its value down relative to where it would be if there wasn't this kind of intervention by the central bank. So they had a very undervalued currency, which is basically a subsidy to exports. And 95% of what China exports is industrial goods, manufacturers of one sort or another. So manufacturing was getting a big subsidy, and this, remember, was the period in which China's exports were growing extremely rapidly after they joined the WTO. But the flip side of that is that the undervalued exchange rate was also an implicit tax on goods that are not traded. And most of what's not traded is services. Services are typically thought of as non-traded goods. Uh, you know, people don't fly to Beijing to get their hair cut or have an operation or something like that. So um, the undervalued currency encouraged investment in the industrial sector and was part of the whole program of industrial sector investment-driven growth. That began to change slowly starting in 2005. And by today, the currency's appreciated about 55% in real terms compared to the middle of 2005. And the subsidy to manufacturing has by and large disappeared. I agree with the, with the International Monetary Fund in which they said they made their definitive assessment last year saying that the RMB is no, should no longer be regarded as an undervalued currency. What has happened? We can see the confirmation of what's happened in that. Remember I said in the decade of the 2000s, the share of investment going into manufacturing and the industrial sector more broadly was going up and the service sector was going down. Now in the last three years, the share of China's overall investment that's going into services has started to go up. Last year was close to 60 percent. In other words, entrepreneurs, most of the Chinese economy is private with the exception of some sectors where the, where the state has preserved uh, you know, uh, its own uh, sphere of influence, so to speak. Uh, most of the investment is private, and increasingly uh, private businesses see there are more opportunities arising in the service sector than in the manufacturing sector, so we're seeing a shift of investment into uh, manufacturing. I've already mentioned the, the other factor, the relative labor intensity of, of, uh, of services production. This increases the demand for labor in a kind of as a feedback effect into the labor market that causes wages to go up and you kind of repeat the cycle. Now the main point I want to stress is that I use the word structural because I think most of these drivers of service sector growth will continue to be quite important uh, in the coming years. Uh, the demographics are built in, the angle curve is built in, this is a phenomenon we see in all countries, there are no exceptions. Uh, I don't think the government's going to roll back the social safety net for obvious reasons. I don't think they're going back. Uh, to have an undervalued currency, and labor intensity of service production is in the inherent nature of services as compared to manufacturing. Manufacturing, you have a lot of economies of scale and so forth. You don't have that so much in the service sector. So I think the, the relative rapid growth of the service sector is likely to continue, and that's one of the reasons I don't think China is going to have a hard landing. Remember I mentioned earlier Services are a bit over 50% of GDP. According to official data, they grew at a little over 8% last year. So the service sector alone is contributing at least four percentage points to China's uh, GDP growth. And the industrial sector is growing much more slowly, but it's still growing a little bit. So when you start looking at the economy from this perspective, a growth rate in the 6% range, uh, maybe not absolutely as high as 6.9, but something in the 6% range seems like a reasonable estimate of what was uh, happening in the Chinese economy last year. The other narrative that they're into the hard landing, that they're growing at 2 or 3% or soon will be, uh, doesn't seem to be supported by the, the kinds of, of evidence that we, can, uh, that we can look at and analyze. So I'm against the hard landing hypothesis. I'm against the super bears who uh, think uh, and talk in, in doom and gloom terms. Now, in the last uh, part of my remarks, I, I want to turn to what about the longer run? How, you know, how is China going to do over a five or a 10 year period? Yes, services are going to help them, help them out here. And I want to give you two different approaches uh, as to what the growth path might be, and the bottom line of both of them is very simple. If China undertakes the additional reforms that I think it needs, and which it had agreed to that in the document that the party put out 
in the fall of 2013, the so-called Third Plenum document, which outlined a very comprehensive set of reforms, uh, I think they have a very good understanding of what they need to do. So the first idea uh, that I want to talk about is what some people call convergence. And the, the idea is very simple. When you're far from the frontier, the frontier is typically the United States in, in recent history. Uh, if you're a country with a per capita income that's far below the United States, you have the potential to borrow technology, to absorb technology uh, from the West more generally, and grow fast and catch up. And what this diagram does is for four other countries in East Asia, shows you that catch-up factor. The diagram is a little complicated, but let's just take Japan, for example. The, the yellow squares tell you where the country was when it started its rapid growth and its catch-up. Uh, and all these countries were roughly at about, about uh, you read it on the right-hand side, and have my glasses on for a minute. They're all roughly at about 20 to 25 percent of the U.S. level. And then you can see they grew quite rapidly in Japan. It started in the early 50s. In South Korea, it started in the mid-70s. Taiwan, also in the mid-70s. I'll skip Singapore. Uh, and they all grew very fast, and the number at the top of the bar tells you how fast they grew uh, in that 20-year period. And basically, you can see they grew at about 8 or maybe as much as 9% per year. Now, the little triangle at the top tells you where they were relative to the US when their growth started to slow down. Um, and for most of these countries, we're looking at roughly 55, 60% of the US level. That's when their growth tapered off and they began to grow more slowly. Obviously, a number of factors you can point to the you know, the Japanese and the, you know, the Louvre Accord and all kinds of other details of the 70 and the oil, uh, the big oil price spike in 74 and Japan slowed down. But the point here is that China today, by this measure of per capita income, which is, I think, in the footnotes, um, measured in purchasing power parity terms, which we don't need to go into, China today is at 25% of the U.S. level. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means a couple of things. First of all, it means that China started its rapid growth in the late 70s from an extraordinarily low level. China's economy today is at least 25 times bigger than it was in 1978. Population has grown some, obviously, over a period of 35 years or so. But the economy is much, much bigger, and it is, has grown very, very rapidly, uh, something close to 10 percent already for 35 years. So if you think that you know, the catch-up is in th 30 years and you're done, then you're, China's done. But China started at such a low base that it's only now, today, in relative terms, where Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan were when their rapid economic growth began. So the basic takeaway is that China still has significant convergence potential, significant catch-up potential. It doesn't mean that it's automatic. You have to adopt the kind of policies that allow you to capture that potential. So uh, this is pointing to potential, not, is not a forecast uh, for what they will do. It's a forecast for what they might do if they engaged in a more significant economic reform over the next few years. Uh, you know, Larry Summers has a different idea. He's writing about it all the time. He thinks China's going to converge to 3%. Uh, he says, oh, they've already been growing for 30 years. Nobody's kept, you know, they've been growing faster for longer than any other country in recorded history. And he says, well, nobody grows this fast for 30 years, beyond 30 years, so they will grow down to 3%. Uh, well, maybe they will go down to 3%, but I don't think it's inevitable. And I think if they, if they uh, undertake the right kind of economic reforms, they still have a significant uh, potential for catch-up, or what, uh, what is sometimes called convergence. Now, the other, uh, the other aspect that comes, quite frankly, to, to a very similar conclusion is to look at the state sector in China and to try to recognize what a very substantial drag on China's economic growth that the state sector represents. I wrote a book in 2014 that's called Markets Over Mao, in which I documented the critical importance of the private sector in explaining China's economic growth since 1978. 
The private sector accounts for all of the job creation that occurred in China since 1978, which is a lot, you know, in the hundreds of millions. Uh, most of the growth of output, most of the growth of exports, and I could go on. But the state sector, as you can see from uh, diagram 13, uh, yeah, still controls a lot of assets. You might, this is partly a legacy issue. They were, you know, they had a lot of investment over the years. They control a lot of assets. It's a little over 100 trillion uh, RMB in 2013, 100, 100, 100, uh, 100 trillion RMB in 2013 is roughly twice China's GDP. So they don't contribute so much to economic growth anymore, They're, but they have a lot of assets. Now, the next diagram shows, what you, shows you what they do with those assets. And as you can see, the Zhu Rongji reforms, which you may not remember, but were in the late 90s in which they downsized a lot of state-owned enterprises, and some of them went bankrupt, some of them were privatized. They got rid of the worst performing ones, and you can see that from 98 on, the return on assets of these state companies improved quite dramatically. I mean, it was pathetically low. It's measured on the right-hand side. It was pathetically low in 98, around 1 percent. Then it went up to about 7 percent. But you can see now the trend is down. It's back down to 3 percent. And the impetus of the Zhu Rongji reforms, I would say, had been lost. They got rid of the worst performers, but they couldn't keep up the momentum. They went into the WTO. That created a lot of new competition and new incentives. But the effect of that seems to have waned uh, in more recent years, and the productivity of state companies is very low. And just to make it very stark, look at the the second to the last diagram, where you compare the performance of these state companies with private companies. Uh, you can see private companies have continued to go up uh, all the way through 2011. They've come down a little bit as China's growth has slowed down. Uh, but since roughly 2010, the performance of private companies is three times better than, than state companies. So. Either you, you increase competition and get the state companies to perform better. If they can't perform better, they should be required to sell assets, maybe even be taken over by private companies so you get the assets into the hands of companies that can make better use of the assets. If, we, if China was able to do that, this would add enormously to economic growth, because remember, it's a, over 100 trillion in assets uh, on a 50 trillion GDP in 2013. If you could raise that up to 4 percent, it would be a big, big increment to growth. Uh, so my view is that they need to open up some of these sectors that have been closed to private firms, sectors like upstream oil and gas, telecommunications, uh, finance, uh, banking, insurance, uh, securities, and so forth, where state firms are still completely dominant. So my conclusion is, yes, China's growth is slowing, partly for a good reason, to slow down property investment, which I think had some risks associated with it. But the super bears that are saying 3 or 4 percent, I, I don't think is, is uh, remotely uh, plausible. I think the transition to growth driven by consumption and services is underway. It's still um, modest, but I think it will continue uh, because it's largely driven by structural uh, factors of the type that I talked about. And I think if they reform appropriately, China has a future of a significant period of growth in the 7 percent range rather than uh, slowing down to the, the, to the, to the you know, medium uh, single digits. Thank you. So I hope I. Thank you very much. That was uh, fascinating and different from what one reads in the newspapers. Uh, two somewhat related questions. The financial sector is uh, considered to be having uh, severe difficulties, and that is not unrelated to the problems in the, uh, with the SOEs. A uh, large uh, proportion of, un of um, uh, loans that are not being serviced properly. 
What impact does that have on the kind of scenario you paint out, you paint? Second one is a little bit more of a speculative question. Do you think that the increase in authoritarianism in China has something to do with uh, the changes that the government is planning to do? Thank you. I didn't catch one word in the second question. The increase in what? Authoritarianism. Authoritarianism, OK. Well, the, the financial sector is the weak underbelly of this economy, and it is primarily, as I indicated, uh, state-owned companies are borrowing too much, and uh, their return on assets is very low, and uh, appears that a significant chunk of the money they borrow is not invested. They're using it to pay operating expenses. In other words, the, their efficiency is so low, they can't cover their wages and their electric bill and their suppliers uh, from the income of the sale of their products, so they just keep borrowing more money. This is obviously not sustainable in the long run and ultimate will, ultimately will require uh, you know, some remediation, uh, substantial write-off of loans from the banking system, uh, maybe even some recapitalization. Uh, it's very difficult. The size of the problem is uh, difficult to measure, I think, even if you're on the inside, and I think from the outside it's nearly impossible. There is one thing we can say with confidence, and that is the longer they wait to address this problem, the worse it gets. And that is one of the reasons I'm encouraged by the announcement in recent weeks that they're going to lay off 1.8 million people in the steel and coal sectors, which are the biggest money-losing sectors right now. Uh, and they're going to devote 100 billion RMB to try to retrain these people, give them better unemployment insurance, or get them onto their pensions a few years earlier than they would otherwise uh, be eligible. And this is a very important step to stop the bleeding. People say, well, how can they do that? Won't there be social instability, unrest, workers in the streets? Well, there could be some of that. 1.8 million always sounds like a lot, but everything in China is a lot. The modern sector workforce, the urban workforce, is in excess of 400 million. So laying off 1.8 million, you know, not everybody is going to be on the streets. It's going to be, there may be a lot of people on the streets proportionally in a few cities that are very heavily coal or, or steel oriented. So I think that's a, a positive sign. Now, the, your second question was on uh, authoritarianism. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm not a political scientist, so you shouldn't listen to what I say. But, uh, you know, Xi Jinping obviously feels, uh, you know, he has dramatically increased. Um, the role of the party, the restrictions on intellectuals, the crackdown on NGOs and human rights lawyers and so forth and so on. So I think politically China is going through a very uh, difficult period. Now the optimists say, well, he wants to be in firm control before he undertakes these reforms that might be somewhat destabilizing. I don't know. It might be the case that he just wants more control no matter what. I, I, I can't tell. My name is Viktor Rabinovich. Um, I'm really struck, of course, by the extraordinary um, savings rates, uh, uh, household saving rates that you were referring to. And sure, there's a somewhat of a decline. Nevertheless, it's still a vast amount of money that has to be invested somewhere. And that somewhere, I think, in the past had gone into at least some of the uh, property uh, development and uh, some of the investments made by whether banking uh, uh, companies or by uh, what shadow banking companies into um, uh, property development. With the slowdown in property development now, what is the impact overall on the health of the banking sector? And what is the impact, at least on the psychology, of people who are saving and hoping to get some return on their savings? There, this is a very interesting question, and the answer is maybe a little bit complicated, but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. China in the decade of the 2000s was what I think most economists would call a highly, re a highly repressed financial system. And the main characteristic of that system was that savers earned nothing on their savings. Uh, in the decade of the 2000s, the average return to banks' savings deposits declined by 300 basis points compared to the previous period, and aver the average return was negative. And so 
one, in my view, is that one of the reasons people started piling into property in the 2000s was that property prices kept going up and up and up. And so people, you know, if you're saving 40% of your income and you can put it in the bank and it's slowly evaporating, or you can buy, and a lot of people were buying a second house because prices were going up year after year in many cities at double digit rates. So it seemed like a very good investment. So a lot of money went into property and that's one of the, re financial repression is one of the ways they got onto this overinvestment in property. Now the good news is that the degree of financial repression has very substantially eased They've liberalized interest rates. Uh, inflation has come down, and that combination means that bank savings deposits now are earning a positive return. And there has been a liberalization of the financial sector. Uh, Alibaba, this very well-known firm, has started a money market fund that for a while was paying about 200 basis points more than bank deposits. I thought, sure, the government was going to shut it down, but they didn't. Uh, they let it keep going, and the, the rates, the 200, in the two percentage point differential got eroded a little bit. And then you had the rise of wealth management products, which was another savings vehicle that offered uh, higher returns than bank deposits. So the, this kind of implicit tax on the household sector has uh, substantially eased. And I think that's one of the reasons why investment in property is moderating. People are seeing, well, we've been through two or three years of declining property prices. Real interest rates are a little bit higher for savers, so people are at the margin reallocating more of their savings into financial assets rather than, than into real property. Now, what's the effect of this in the health of the banking system? Um, the, banks, the banks in China are still pretty profitable as measured by return on assets. Um, and they certainly did that in part in the previous decade because they didn't have to pay much for the deposits because the deposit rate had a ceiling. So the banks were generating uh, fairly high returns. Um, it is said that this will begin to come down as they have to pay higher rates on deposits because of liberalization of deposit rates, but it hasn't really happened yet. Uh, so the main concern about the banking sector uh, is the degree of non-performing loans. And the good news is that the share of money that these banks lend to state-owned companies, the absolute amount, of course, has gone up a lot, but the share of money that they lend to these companies has, gone, has been cut in half compared to the 90s when we had the last big bank recapitalization. And that's in part because of the rise of private enterprises that are getting a very large share of bank lending now uh, in the corporate lending sphere, and the rise of household lending. In the 90s, uh, banks didn't lend any money to households, um, but the property market began in the late 90s, and now in most periods about 35, 40 percent of all the loans are going to households rather than to businesses. And they still have very strong standards for getting a mortgage. You have to come up with a down payment. Um, you know, it's kind of like the United States in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you know, you had to come up with 20 or 30 percent down payment and you had to keep paying the mortgage. There is no refi in China. You know, you can't check the paper the next morning and say, oh, I'm going to refinance my house and take out a couple hundred thousand dollars and go to Barbados on vacation for a few weeks. <laughs> and you can't get a home equity loan. So you, have, you start with a big down payment and you keep, you keep paying it down. So the average loan to value ratio in the Chinese housing market is very low. So I don't think there's much of a risk of default. Uh, so the biggest problem still is with the loans to state companies. And this is a relatively small portion of total bank lending. So the recapitalization challenge, I don't think, would be on the same scale in relative terms as it was in the very early 2000s when they, uh, when they recapitalized uh, the major state-owned banks. David Dodge. I think this is an excellent presentation and, and reasonably balanced, not going all the way to where Larry is, but perhaps a little bit too optimistic. And the reason that, uh, or what I would like you to explain, is in chart nine, you've given what I think is very sensible. You've said that services can absorb a lot more people than industry did, and so the transition, as we lay off all these people in the north, uh, that services can pick it up, pick up the employment. 
The trouble on the service side, though, historically, as we've seen around the world, is the productivity has generally been lower than the productivity in that very industry sector that they're replacing. Uh, and so the rate of growth of productivity in China, which has been enormous, partly because of the move off the land, but also because the, the industrial productivity has risen dramatically over time, it's hard to see that that productivity growth can continue in the same way as they move into the service sector. At least it's hard for me to consider it. Obviously, if you're going to stay at seven, you believe that that can be so. And so I'd just like you to explain why you think they can get that productivity growth in the service sector to keep that income growing in the way it has been. Well, um, you're, you're absolutely right. It is frequently the case that uh, services pay somewhat lower wages than manufacturing and that productivity growth is, is uh, a little bit less uh, over time. The, the reason I'm still a little bit optimistic is that at the moment there are a large number of people employed in the industrial sector that are not producing anything. So if they shift into the service sector, maybe their productivity will be low but it will be higher than where they were. Let me give you a specific example. In the steel sector, it is said that, uh, the, you know, they have, we don't want to get into the details, but several hundred million tons of excess steel capacity that they want to get rid of. Well, my reaction to that is, well, what are they going to do, break up the furnaces and sell it for scrap? They won't, they won't earn very much that way. But the problem is these, fa these steel companies still have the workforce on hand that could produce those extra couple hundred million tons. So these people are getting paid, uh, maybe not from the revenues of the company, but from borrowing from the banks and other sources of finance. So really their value added is negligible, perhaps even zero. So if you move them into a service sector job, uh, you know, it might not have the same productivity as the, the workers that are still gainfully employed in the steel sector, but it'll be a lot higher than what they were doing. So I think there's, there's still a potential for raising growth. The, this, is an, this is a problem that's characteristic of the state sector. When, you know, when demand for the product slows down, they, in the old days they used to keep producing and it went into inventory. Now they don't do that anymore. But they keep the workers on the payroll. They still get the benefits. Uh, they may get a slight reduction in their pay. Some of them, they don't have to come to work. They have this, this classification called off post. Off post means you're kind of semi laid off, but you haven't really been separated from your firm. You still get some of the benefits and you still get a big chunk of your salary. But they're not doing anything. They're not adding to value. They're not producing anything. So moving these people into uh, other kinds of job is, would definitely be an improvement. Ian Shugart. Um, <clears throat> the other area, of course, in the service sector that has potential for productivity growth is in public services like health care and education and so on. Do you see the overall financial policies of the government uh, supporting the rapid growth of those sectors as the middle class and this uh, uh, consumer-led growth occurs? And I also had a question about the what we might call the more purely innovative side of the economy. How, what are the prospects for China as it has become more globally engaged and the high education sector has, has grown? What prospects do you see for the more purely innovative side of the economy to contribute to growth? Well, the second question, the second part of the question is a very tough one, but I'll take a crack at it. But <clears throat> let me take the first one on education and health. Government expenditures in these areas has been rising uh, in absolute terms, of course, a little bit in terms of percentage of GDP. Uh, so there has been, you know, they have made very major strides in increasing uh, enrollment in secondary schools, secondary school graduation rates. They've dramatically expanded uh, tertiary education in recent years. So some more resources are going into that. The healthcare sector is more difficult to judge. It's a mess. 
for a number of reasons. They rely too much on drug sales and so forth. But the good news is that they, they are allowing now the private sector to begin to have a role. Uh, again, according to the Chinese data, if you look at investment in education, a few years ago private investment was negligible. Now it's up to 15 percent of total investment. So you see the rise of private schools. Some of them are highly specialized, you know, Wall Street English or whatever it's called, you know, where they have hundreds of outlets where they're teaching people English that want to learn English. Or their, their preschool or their private kindergartens. Uh, there are even a few private universities. And in the healthcare, the thing, the, the same trend is underway. There are now a significant, well, I think there's something like 2,000 hospitals that have private funding now in China. Now, that's not a very big number in the, China, in the Chinese scheme of things, but a few years ago it would have been much less. So I think it's a twofold response. There's a bit more public money going into those things, uh, but there's a bit more private money. And a lot of the private money, of course, is driven by this demand that I was talking about earlier. People want a higher standard of health care than they can get going to the municipal hospital, and so uh, entrepreneurial individuals and foreign companies as well are moving in to the healthcare space and that has been somewhat uh, liberalized. So the, you know, the demand is there and the supply response is coming uh, at least in, increasingly from the private sector including foreign firms. Now the innovative, you know, how are they doing in the innovative area? Well, you know, in some ways it appears that China's doing very well. I mean, they have, they have more online finance than we do. A higher share of their retail sales is through e-tail than it is in the United States. Uh, you know, you look at the number of people that are paying online, uh, all these uh, payment services, the rise of P2P lending and crowdfunding, it's, it's, it's taking off. Uh, in China. So at least in the financial, and Alibaba is playing a big role. They've now started their own, their own bank uh, called MyBank. Tencent, their competitor, uh, has a bank called WeBank. Um, these are two genuinely private banks that were licensed by the government a couple of years ago, and they're engaged in uh, you know, increasing lending, uh, volume of lending activity and providing some competition to the traditional uh, state banks. So certainly in the internet space, um, I think there's a lot of innovation going on uh, in China and as reflected in, in some of the indicators that I mentioned. Okay, so I just wanted to, um, on behalf of CG, thank Dr. Lardy for coming here to share his insights with us, and I'm going to take advantage of my two minutes and uh, make a couple of comments on what Dr. Lardy had to say. Um, so uh, I'm glad the last uh, question was about innovation because uh, I think in January, uh, Xi Jinping uh, reiterated the, the position of the Chinese government that uh, under the new normal uh, of slower economic growth, uh, there are really three uh, new drivers the government sees as potentially keeping the Chinese economy going, and these are services, household consumption, and innovation. So we've heard from Dr. Lardy a lot about the transition to the uh, services um, you know, at the expense of manufacturing, and we also heard uh, the transition at a slower space to a domestic private consumption-based growth model but uh, I'm just uh, really intrigued by the juxtaposition of these two charts. Um, you can see um, one of them has been far more successful so far. Uh, uh, the, the second transition has been at a slower pace. So my own, I guess, speculation is that the transition to services is less politically contentious than uh, the transition to a, a more domestic consumption-based model of growth. Uh, it, it's just, uh, I think, uh, very interesting to, to see the political factors uh, at work uh, in, in these a tale of two transitions, so to speak. Um, so the third issue uh, about innovation, I'm a little bit less uh, optimistic than Dr. Lardy uh, because of what one of the uh, questions uh, mentioned before of the authoritarian nature, uh, which has really in recent weeks and months become so much more um, severe than in recent years. So in a climate like this, uh, there are certainly severe constraints to, to 
many kinds of innovation. So the second uh, very quick comment I wanted to make uh, is uh, it is interesting to consider the implications for uh, the rest of the world uh, in light of China's transition to a new model of economic growth. So certainly the domestic consumption, um, the, the rising importance of domestic consumption, even though at a slower pace, is going to have worldwide implications. On the one hand, I mean, the good news is, well, the trade surplus of China probably will go down uh, over time. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you're a, a commodities-dependent uh, country, uh, of which Canada <laughs> is one, um, then the, re the reduction of manufacturing, uh, the rise of services, may not necessarily be uh, good news. Uh, so uh, something to, to think about. And, and lastly, as China at least tries to become more innovative, uh, we might um, see in the next few years an even more obvious turn away from um, foreign investment coming out of China into resource uh, rich countries, but uh, maybe a rise uh, into uh, of that kind of investment in countries where high end manufacturing and uh, tech sectors are particularly developed. So anyway, I just thought I'd share a few thoughts and I want to thank you again, Dr. Lardy, for a very informative and enlightening presentation. Thank you all.